Welcome to the Software People Stories. I'm Shiv. I'm Chitra. And I'm Gaiti. We bring you interesting untold stories of people associated with the creation or consumption of software-based solutions. You'll hear stories of what worked and sometimes what didn't. You will also hear very personal experiences and insights that would trigger your thoughts and inspire you to do even greater things. A techie, entrepreneur and coder since his childhood, Sunil Mukundan joined a friend to start building an electronic stethoscope and in addition to learning the ins and outs of software, he also learned about hardware and its integration with software. His wealth of experience is fascinating to listen to as he talks about being in a startup and having customers buying your product as a priceless first-hand experience. His approach to software architecture taking care to examine considerations specifically enterprise software and understanding domain to design least disruptive integrated and frictionless software. His trial by fire experiences and being able to look back and retrospect with a sense of learning and amusement and by sitting on different sides of the table through his career, understanding the whys of everything and getting into learning about the process behind decisions with the help of great mentors. He says why building software that's self-healing and has non-disruptive capabilities is important when you work with constraints in a startup and about the composition of startup teams. There's a lot in this episode for our listeners, so tune in, folks. Welcome to the Software People Stories, Sunil. Thank you, Shiv. It's, been a, it's a pleasure to be here. Let's dive into your questions. In... Okay. I, as I said, now, this is more of a conversation than a question. So, yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, primarily, absolutely. There are some questions triggered more by my curiosity in uh, understanding Sunil the person. Sure. Where, uh, right, this is not a tech talk. So sure. From that perspective, even though you have been a techie all along, you've uh, been an architect, you've been a startup entrepreneur, a lot of dimensions that you have. Right. So how did this all begin? Well, it all began, I mean, the beginning, like... I, I did not design for my career in startups to be the way it was. The initial thing happened by chance, right? I mean, I graduated in 2001 in the midst of all the, you know, the 2001 twin attacks and bombing and all that. And my on-campus recruitment that I, the job I had through my campus recruitment, they had postponed their joining date and all that. So they temporarily put all the new candidates on hold. So I was uh, stuck and I didn't know what to do at that point of time. My dad was also had a terminal cancer. So I did not want to go to the US at that point of time. I wanted to wait uh, and see what happens. So, I mean, I was sort of forced to stay in, in Chennai. And at the same time, I wanted to do something, but the job that I had, we couldn't move forward with that. So it was at that time, uh, one of my friends actually stopped did a startup, right? And he was from College of Engineering India and fresh out of college, he did a startup. So he just said, hey, why don't you join me and see how it goes, right? Maybe your your company will call you, call you back six, seven months down the line and then you can make a choice whether you want to continue in the startup and or you want to go and take that job, it's fine, right? Whatever it is, you can make your choice at that point of time. Now that you're, you know, sort of uh, free, why don't you join and see what happens? So this thing happened by chance. And, and one of the things things is even, even at school and when I was growing up, I used to, I, I was more, more into computers than the average person at that point of time, right? In school and in college, I, I learned coding pretty early about sixth, seventh standard working, starting with GW basic and all that. And, and Pascal was a major sort of, I worked a lot on Pascal. So I started coding at a relatively young age because my dad was in, in an area where he knew that computers are going to be the next big thing. So he started in, started pushing me into computers and all this at a very early. So that way, you know, you could say that I was sort of very lucky, privileged, blessed in a lot of these things fell into place. My friends always knew that he knows computers and he knows programming and all that. So that's what sparked my friend's interest in asking me to join him, right? So it is some, some things, you know, you sort of build a portfolio or something and unknowingly you're building a portfolio, right? When you're, when you're starting to explore mm. things in life, right? 
and without your mm-hmm. own knowledge you are building a portfolio actually and people actually notice these things you may not think too much of it you know you are doing it for your own interest and you like it but people actually make a note and at some point it will come back and help you every little exploration that i have done somewhere it sort of helped me even even as a conversation starter with somebody right so all these things add up and so coming back to the story right he asked me to join and after working there for a month i decided you know i don't know how the job in the company that had offered me a job is going to be but this sure is exciting right so we were building devices that were taking you know heart measurements right an electronic stethoscope if you could say that right and we were okay. analyzing the signals to see if there are anomalies way ahead of its mm. time right way mm-hmm. ahead of its time but it was very interesting work right and it was very close to what i had studied in engineering in electronics and communication it wasn't too coding heavy it was very heavy on signal processing and uh, neural networks and all that so i mean it started off very exciting right i mean it was like a, i thought you know this is a good place to be so i really i decided at the end of the first month that even if the job comes in i most likely i'm not going to take it mm. and it never came so it made my decision he said so they never honored the offer so it was fine so that's how it started so that's how i joined the startup right but at that point i didn't know anything about a startup or anything right i mean it was a startup in the sense that it was a bunch of guys who had you know started doing something that was my entry into startup i would say it is chance right I, it's not like i planned my entire life to be in a startup or anything it's just chance mm-hmm. but then the interest got picked after that and and it's like a drug right in the sense that once you work in a startup and that adrenaline that it's an invigorating experience in the sense that you are everything you can contribute to everything that is relevant to the product there's a lot of freedom in what you want to pick and choose because it is always a case of lesser hands than what is required so you can pick up many things and if you are really interested you are if you have a curious mind right then you will always like to work in a startup right i mean you don't have to be some genius intelligence or you know high iq person right i mean even i mean i'm just average above average student so all you need is a very 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 open and curious mind and then you will really be interested in a startup startup will be able to satisfy your sort of mm, nice. curiosity probably, probably those days even the term startup was not very popular and that's why i'm saying i'm very lucky yeah. right yeah. extremely lucky yeah. right you know yeah. i mean that brings a question of from the time you started programming you said gw basic and all that right uh, which we typically call as the programming in the small right right compared right. to that now there are too many things right out of college you had to work as a team and it is no longer just about software like you said probably a lot of other things that were there maybe integrating with devices actually touching and feeling something that will host your software right 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 uh, how was that transition or how did you well get adjusted to that or get uh, acclimatized to that well i was uh, i was helped a lot by my peers right i was only one component of the company that joined right there are people who had worked in system side and all that who had also joined and personally i learned a lot from people around me so that helped a lot because i i you are right i had a very sort of narrow mind of soft you know narrow vision about software right and it wasn't very it was very very programming centric right it was very very software centric it was not systems oriented but that was just the exposure i had at that point of time right but in college i did pick up a few of my uh, friends were into this kind of hardware interfacing with software kind of thing so i did pick up a little bit there but i never got really interested in it because maybe i did not have that wiring for you know real hardware right even though i was in electronics that wiring wasn't there probably in me to pick it up at that point of time but like you pointed out it again i would attribute it to learning after i joined the startup right mm-hmm. it wasn't something that i knew when i joined the startup i joined startup thinking that they picked me for some thing that i knew right and that was a very narrow tunnel vision of what i thought software was or what i thought programming was right 
but it it turned out to be much bigger than that and i learned on the job but then you know i mean subsequently every system that we built had a huge part of hardware though over time the hardware design that we did in house has reduced with the commoditization of hardware and components to such a huge extent in china and taiwan and all that but i did pick up a lot in my first startup in terms of this system side and interfacing with something that people can touch and feel right because my tunnel vision software was something that was completely different right human input through a keyboard or mouse was all i was aware of right and something running reading something from a disk or a database and processing mounds of data that that was my idea of what software was right it was very different and if i was so wrong obviously and but i did pick it up right mm-hmm. i mean over time i picked up this that again right it's just exposure and an open mind curiosity i did not stick to the tunnel vision obviously i was very interested once i started to see these kind of systems that people build where there is touch and feel and and the way software interacts with other real components in life and all that i mean obviously i was very very interested so i did pick up these things in as i moved in my career and also as you were explaining earlier your career has also been about architecting more of enterprise systems or systems that go in the background and all that there probably right. there are many more moving parts that may not even be visible to you when you are conceiving your solution oh yeah yeah of course see i mean one of the biggest things about enterprise software is how and where you insert your software right where it's going to run what are the other sort of subsystems that it's going to talk to and how disruptive or not disruptive it's going to be right and uh, that comes one of the pillars of architecting any product that you build for enterprise because without that it is meaningless right you cannot go and say you know if you want to put my software you have to change like 10 other things that are around it right you cannot put a disruptive solution inside an enterprise system right it has to merge in seamlessly do its job and also have a predictable way of providing value to the enterprise is a very very tricky thing like you said right i mean compatibility with other softwares hardwares all sorts of things will come into play and lot of standardization effort has gone on but as you know right i mean the way standards themselves evolve is somebody blazes a trail and then eventually that becomes a standard so if you are at the cutting edge of technology somebody is blazing that trail already right so it means that you know you are always somewhere at some point working with something that is not so standardized and not sort of it, it may not there, there are challenges integrating with these kind of uh, products and all that but that that is one of the challenges of the enterprise uh, domain uh, like you rightly pointed out and a lot of thought has to go into that and much of the problems get solved with a lot of domain knowledge in a particular place so one of the things that i realized with enterprise software is there is no one enterprise software right even in enterprise you have to have some sort of specialization because a domain is very important like over a period of time networking has sort of become the domain that i have gone deepest into and with that i now understand how enterprise networking works and how to design products that are least disruptive and how to design products that work very well without having to touch others other things right so but that comes with a lot of experience time and spending a lot of time with customers and working on the field right one of the things that you get to do as a startup is if you get to a phase where your product actually gets sold which is a big deal trust me so if you get to a stage where your product gets sold and gets deployed in a real customer environment then if you are in a startup you get you get that vital experience of being in that place where it's being deployed you get that it's priceless it's a priceless commodity in the sense that you experience being there and seeing how it is actually integrated right how it actually turns on and actually starts working in the enterprise so this you can learn only if you are in a startup because if you are in a big company and doing the same thing right there are layers and layers of support and value added services and all sorts of teams that will come in and try to do that job 
right? Uh, which is not bad. I mean, that's the way those companies are organized. But that key piece of understanding you will not realize, right? Because typically what happens is a lot of people who are in this area where they actually go to the field and deploy, right? The field engineers, you could call them, right? They are not product minded. They don't have a vision of strategy or how you can take this or how you can identify a hole there and sort of see if there is a product feature that is valuable that could add on to your product, which could make things much easier, right? As an engineer, if you have a feel, you know, sort of flair for this kind of thing, if you get into the field, you can really learn a lot, right? And that will that will be direct feedback to you improving your own product, identifying areas in the future where you could work on and give you a ringside view on how actually uh, these systems are working in cohesion, right? And then you know how to sort of build something that can fit in that complex mesh of things that are there. So I think that's another another benefit of working in a startup is that you get the opportunity to actually be there and do it. Yeah, very nicely put. In fact, one thing I've heard is that success or at least not making mistakes comes from experience. Yes. And experience come from, comes from making mistakes. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So, so you have any stories of how you got this experience? Uh, Maybe on the funny side also. Well, to make I it mean, there are a lot of, at least the last couple of gigs that I did are all enterprise networking products, right? And they are in the line of fire, right? In the sense that if something goes down, actually it costs money, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. like a lot of times we've got off, we had our product running in, in a huge theater chain in US and uh, they're going to open booking in five minutes. <laughs> Nothing seems to be working. right? And these kind of situations, mm. uh, you know, I mean, suddenly, you know, like about five engineers debugging this problem, looking at different things. right? And suddenly somebody just says, hey, you know, maybe there are duplicates out there in the network, right? Because it it, it did not, nothing else made sense, right? And it turns out that we had gone and configured sort of duplicate IP addresses in different places and things like that. But the part that I wanted to emphasize is that in that, we learned that these kind of things have to be avoided at the time of deployment. So you learn this, right? Nobody is going to come and tell you, hey, build this feature so that you can avoid all these kind of situations cropping up, right? It will not come from your product development. It will not come from sales. It will not come from marketing, right? Nobody wants this feature. It's not a feature actually, right? It is to protect your own ass, right? In the end, you don't want to be in the situation where somebody is going to open in five minutes and you don't know what the hell is going on, right? So as engineers, you come back and that very night sort of, (laughs) we sort of built that thing where this will not happen again, right? Mm -hmm. So... So, I mean, a lot of these things uh, is trial by fire. And like you said, right, it's always, you know, if something bad happens, then for sure, there is something extremely good that will get done out of that. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I mean, there are, I wouldn't say, I mean, at the end of it, right, once we fixed it, it, the whole thing was very funny because it is just a huge set of stupid things that were done, right? an accumulation yeah. of stupid things that were done that led us to that situation. It was very funny when we thought of what and all people have done to get us to that place. But at that point, it wasn't funny at all. Yeah, absolutely. And then I also want to talk about uh, the other phase or the other aspect, right. which is, yeah, you said being startup, designing products and all that, but you've also been an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur, so to say. Well, <laughs> when you, yeah, so the question is yeah the startups themselves yeah being part of a startup is one thing yeah there is a team that finally puts everything together you conceive things etc but as a startup or as a founder co-founder etc there are a lot of ambiguities you probably have to take some bets you decide on some things you believe in some things which may be a little uncomfortable for the traditional engineering thinking where we want everything kind of deterministic. We said we want to be able to specify everything, do everything, and it should work. Right? Right. So how did you either get adjusted to that or acquire an aptitude for that? I think one of the, I mean, 
very interestingly the i mean i always look at it as two sides of the table right like you as a as a start i i i worked as a startup employee a guy who worked in a startup to a person who was a part of the the first few people who joined the startup to eventually becoming a co-founder right and mm. so if you look at it i've been sitting on the other side of the table first right as an employee a startup employee no different from a normal employee and slowly i've moved to the other side of the table right okay. so in, in this circle i've i've learned through this circle i've learned that there are because everything that seems so anomalous to me right like a hey, why aren't you buying this laptop i need it right so to mm. simple simple things like that right and to why we don't want to do it right i've made that full circle as to why probably somebody did not get that lab why we did not spend that money building that lab right why we didn't spend that 50000 buying a traffic generator at that point of time you know it doesn't make sense as an engineer right dude you we need this right what, what is even what are you even thinking right and then then you think about it right and when you come to that stage you realize that hey you know what who is really asking you for that kind of performance right now you are going into deployments that are much smaller scale where you know it works you can push this out mm. right but as an engineer you don't take that answer you you are trying to build something and you are like you are scared right because in startups right people you don't know what what is going to get thrown at you your your feeling is hey what if i get deployed in that situation right how do i even you know if i'm if i'm in that position where they put it in a deployment where it requires that kind of performance what will i do right it's not a problem really right what that goes into it when they say don't worry right because a lot of times people have told me hey i'm going to do this they say don't worry don't do it don't do it now right so this don't do it now uh, let's do it later right it has always that answer to me has always provoked some thought so over time the other thing is i have also like i said right i started as an employee of a startup but over time i sort of sort of became one of the founding members if you could call that right not founders or anything but founding members the first within the first 5 10 people who joined the startup right that gave me access very very close access to the founders and also i was lucky enough in the sense that after the success of a startup and all that the founders became vcs okay. you know they, they became vcs so i had access to them hmm. right and conversations when you talk to these people access to this kind of network is sort of something you build right and i mean it is something that you, i i was not aware of the value that i was getting from all this because my ceo at the last startup that i was in and the previous one they were very open with me right and they used to talk anything and everything right and they always used to say hey sunil one day if you're going to do this remember this is why you know we are doing it this way okay. right anyway it will be helpful right and and you you pick up these things right so you converse and you can you have the ability you have the channel open with the real decision makers to go and i'm sure they got irritated when i asked them right but a lot of times i've seen with people who are founders also right they would have followed the same process they would have gone through the same cycle so they are very very forgiving when you go and ask them these questions right okay and they they don't really they might get irritated what is his problem why is he even bothered about that but if they see that you are genuinely interested right not asking a question for the sake of asking a question you are really interested in the process of the decision and why you came to the decision they will take the time and they will entertain you and they will give you their time and mind to give you a proper answer as to why it wasn't done the way you so that is how i sort of bridged a lot of this gap right because i learned from all these people i've always surround i've been surrounded with and they have always been very nice to me in the sense that they've always shared these the process right they've always shared the process with me and that has given me a huge fill up in terms of bridging the gap that you were talking about right because as an engineer i i was like exactly what you said right I, you don't even know why people are doing these things right and mm. the the whole disconnect was so huge but then you realize it's not actually a disconnect it's just a process of decision making 
and in startups a lot of times it is the goal is to build at least the kind of startups that i worked in right again there could be other sort of ways of doing this and all that and i'm not there is no blanket this is how it should be done right sort of thing but the kind of startups that i worked in always had a time to market right there is a need for this product now and for the next few years you have to get it out to the market as soon as possible and there is a way to build these kind of products right and you cannot always take you cannot always make the best choices you have to make the smart choices identify the tech debt you are accruing so that you can go and fix it later right you have to be really smart about it and as an engineer it is completely opposite to anything that you want to do right sometimes right this is not what you would do it might look like cutting corners it might look like shoddy work sometimes but there is a method behind this madness and over over time we have become extremely smart at making these decisions right how to build software quickly and yet achieve a certain level of performance and scale and also know that there is a path to that ultimate performance and scalability that you you know how to get to right that's the key you 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 always need to know how you have to get to a point right from a technology standpoint right as long as you know how to get there you can get there you don't have, always have to get there first to get something out to the market so i mean that's how sort of i learned i think it was a long winded answer i don't know how it came out but yeah that's good actually i'm curious to ask a trick question now sir sure. okay. when you say that time to market is probably what is going to guide a lot of things and then yeah, getting something out there and all that even within all these variables is there something that you would consider non negotiable well i think that is a that depends on the software or hardware or the product you are building right in a lot of cases i think the quality of the software is non negotiable right in some cases it is probably negotiable i mean like in the sense that hey if a you know if you are building an app that is giving you recommendations on movies to watch right if it times out a couple of times it's okay right i mean mm-hmm. you may or may not lose customers behave because of that but if you are building a software that the kind of software that we build a downtime means you are going to lose customers right so there is something that is non negotiable in the in, sen- in the sense that quality and the way you fundamentally consider of availability right in terms of software availability right how you build redundancy i mean that becomes fundamental to your product right because software is software right it is bound to fail at some point of time how quickly it can heal and how it, how quickly it can sort of correct itself and become available again is sort of one of the key constructs so that's non negotiable in the space that i work in right there could be other non i mean non negotiables could change in the industries that you work in right like but like for example like if you're in a you know in a big data or some you know machine learning space you know the outcomes are non negotiable right and you have to focus on that that is that is the key and this again right it's the question this is the classic startup problem right if you have infinite money and infinite time right you can build the best product right but that's never the case right you have limited time and limited money in the kind of startups that i work there are of course you know if you have a google like idea or something like that you know the time constraint is a lot lesser right because nobody is going to come you come into the market and beat you to the punch right mm-hmm. so you have that amount of time right and if you have like an idea that is like way ahead of its time it's going to take that amount of time to sort of become a reality and make sense to the market also so these things change right but in the startups that i work usually both are a constraint right and that's where the challenge is and how do you do this is part of the most important sort of lessons that i've learned and how to build software quickly without compromising quality and always uh, build reasonable scale and performance with an eye and an absolutely certain path to how i can get to the ultimate goal in your current team right. do you have freshers okay uh no actually that's a very interesting question i in none of do i joined as a fresher right mm-hmm. this is yeah. the huge irony right the huge irony i joined a startup as a fresher but subsequently the the two successful startups that i had 
never hired thrushes and uh, i mean i have my own theories to it but that is the reality and even in this startup we don't have uh, freshers at least not in the india side of things in in, in the, the us uh, teams had a a couple of i mean i again this is not like we had a huge number of uh, freshers joining us or anything we at least had one or two right in the us side but here in india it was, it was a zero right and this actually pains me a lot because i was a big beneficiary of such an opportunity right but you know i mean it doesn't work out that way uh, because there is i mean i've tried my hand at recruiting freshers here there are a lot of ground realities that are very 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 that make it very difficult for me to hire uh, freshers and that's the reality right i mean in yeah in a, in fact this is a pattern i find in uh, many other startups also primarily one of the things that at least i try to simplify that as a gap between whatever our colleges produce today and what you need for a startup i mean you talked about the the joys and the rewards of being in a startup right. which also probably you were able to reap because you approached it in a particular way or there were uh, some things in the environment that helped you right uh, how do you think Absolutely. and and this is not only for the freshers even though i asked the question as now do you have freshers many people that i have been talking to mm. also when they have this mid career crisis so to say or mm. after a few years right. saying that i don't know what i'm doing i should i do something else and now okay maybe i should start up or should join a startup right, right. then after a quick conversation sometimes you feel that uh, probably the personality or the kind of things that people are expecting they may be disappointed if they get into a startup so it okay. may not that it's not that everybody can get into a startup mode of thinking mm. right so from your experience do you think there are maybe three or four trainable skills or acquirable skills that would make one more startup able if there is a word like that uh so i think i mean to me uh, with exposure anybody can be trained in anything honestly i mean at least the kind of the, see between in between working for spacex and working for normal startups there's a huge gamut of startups and entrepreneurial you know entrepreneurship that is there right it doesn't have to be rocket science and there's a huge gamut of things right and in lot of these places you need people with curiosity high energy and the rest is all trainable according to me right that's i mean this is this is for people with a fresh mind right uh, fresh out of college right just curiosity and an energy a high energy levels to work and learn right if you have that i think at least in the in the uh, you could say that i can represent let's say you know 5% of the startup ecosystem right the kind of products that we build and i've i've always worked in right that a lot of the other things are trainable mm. right but if you don't have that right it is tough fresh out of college for the people with the mid life wanting a change i'm bored with this i want to change right the first thing is change for the sake of change is i i mean that is the first mistake right in the sense that you know hey i've been here you should have a path to what you want and it is not sufficient to say this is not what i want right mm-hmm. you should also know what you want to a certain extent i'm not saying that hey you know it's i mean it's very easy to say i don't like this mm. right so and go to another place right what is the guarantee that you will like that right yeah. it is very important to find out what where you are going to also right and that is probably one thing that is it's it's a philosophical thing more than anything it's very difficult to gauge it in the individual also but uh, for the midlife thing right what i would such uh, what i think is more important right is an open mindset right there because there is a huge amount of unlearning that you will have to do i am not saying that hey you know this is a startup everything will be very different in the end you are building the same software right like i said it's a constrained environment that's it you are building the same kind of software that you are building 
but in a much more constrained environment the constraints are more and you have to be cognizant of these constraints right and as a senior person you will be expected to be cognizant of these things you know, more than a, a guy joining fresh given that you've come with some because people will expect you to know the constraints i mean hey you are going to build this but hopefully you know that these are the challenges that you will come across right so i think to that extent you will have to be open minded in accepting that it's not going to be very different but it will be very different in the sense that you will have to work in a constrained environment and build the same thing but in a more constrained manner so that, to that extent you should have an open mind and uh, the other thing is the as much as i keep talking about depth right start you need to have a certain level of breadth and knowledge also that is uh, i mean you can be deep in one area but you cannot be shallow in anything right over time right so that's another thing that becomes very critical for a startup as you and which is why people at a senior level find it difficult to make the transition also because they have worked in silos and they have become subject matter experts in some areas already right they are very valuable to a startup but at a certain stage once you have built the first level of the product and everything right and then where there is a the product needs a certain guidance in a in a narrow area which is lacking in your existing team that's where people can come in and help so that's another path for people to leverage their subject matter expertise and join but that's still a startup by their definition but it's not a startup startup in the sense that it's not the early days it's probably series b post series b sort of thing right people will call themselves a startup even at that point you can join those kind of startups where you you will not have to unlearn so much right and you will be really valuable but if you're really joining a startup startup right you cannot be shallow in anything that's the that's really the conundrum there right because you have to know you have to be a qa guy you have to you have to understand the web you have to understand systems you have to, i mean depending on the kind of software you build right right from logistics to everything you need to know, know a little bit about everything right you can't be blind sided completely in, in a particular area so that is the conundrum but i i mean like i said right again if you have an open mind and you're willing to say that hey i have gone in a certain path this is a different path if i spend time i can pick it up if you have that open mindset you can join a startup for sure but like you said startups also are very careful about hiring these kind of people because they know that it may not work out mm-hmm. right and in the in the sense that people know what they are looking for in the early stage of a startup and they are looking for certain kind of individuals that it it is very difficult to get into that so yeah. i mean at least the kind of places that i've worked in right the the founding team sort of uh, assembles itself and then we go from there right and for a long time we will be that you know 10 15 people before we sort of start hiring and becoming bigger right and the first 10 15 people sort of hire themselves and because they will come from another startup they would or they would have been sort of a series b startup person who wants to get the experience of series a who's understood the mindset of working mm. in a constrained environment so those are the people who kind of join so like you said open mind is a definite necessity but i think if you're looking to make a change join a startup don't go go to a day one start mm. as your first gig it might not be your right. cup of tea another one of my favorite questions usually the last question is with so much of uh, automation and intelligence coming into software or software based mm-hmm. solutions what is the future of software if somebody is now looking at getting into software or even probably taking up a course and then graduating for students what do you see as the future for software of course it's a very very vast industry <laughs> it's difficult to say that uh, but I, still <laughs> you can hazard you know, whatever you think i i i i really even don't know how to answer that question in the sense that <laughs> Uh, it probably scares the living living daylight out of me also <laughs> so i don't know what to answer there yeah. but uh, see in the end i'm not saying that automation there will always be something for software engineers to do i think automation always has its play right a uh, place right and that is not going to stop us from building things because if you look at the history of automation right you can only automate things that you know very well so you build something and over years you have honed it to a t and then you go and automate it 
in that process the key part is you are always building something new so mm. i trust that mankind will keep building something new mm-hmm. and you can always <laughs> sort of get into that bandwagon and keep going right yeah. so i mean like industrial automation took years today mm. an automobile plant will probably employ 3000 4000 people in my dad's days it was 30 40000 people right but it has taken them 60 years to get to that point to 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 the point that they know exactly what needs to be built and the specifications everything right so you just put in and the whole thing is so automated that it comes out exactly like what you expected and probably better because it's made by machines right but to get to that level automobile has been a fun ride right for people they've spent years and years excited building things new things and now there are newer things right which require human innovation right i mean till a time where these machines start thinking on their own and start building things themselves right i mean if it comes to that then we don't know we are going to be competing with those kind of machines and compute to build something new but even then you will be competing with somebody to build something new right so yeah. it's fine right i mean good on that positive note that we still have a lot of career options and a lot of opportunities that open up maybe new opportunities i think that's just about the time we have for this conversation And, so thanks uh, a lot. Yeah, it's been cool. very interesting. I think a lot of things which uh, we can catch up uh, some other time. Sure, absolutely. I'm I'm open. You can reach out yeah. to me any time, and I'd love to share my experiences for whoever it is useful for. Right? So, yeah, absolutely. It will be. I think all of us go through these things, and when you hear either similar things that somebody else has done or gone exactly. through, or maybe different, at least there is that reassurance. Oh yeah, yeah. I've learned a lot by just listening to people. Right? I mean, mm. in the end, some of it connects. some of it doesn't connect but i always make a point to listen we thanks siddharth for the music and malavika for promoting the software people stories if you like this episode please subscribe on your favorite podcast client and spread the word in your network if you'd like to share your story contact us at podcast@pm-powerconsulting.com